Welcome. Good morning. It's such a beautiful day outside, isn't it? Please stand as you are able for our first hymn. Please join me in our modern affirmation found on 885. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen.
Hey Concord, thanks for joining us for worship today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please text WELCOME to 865-302-3616. Swim on over to the church this Wednesday night for our production of Finding Nemo Jr. Our cast and crew have been hard at work and can't wait to present this special production. Join us Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. in the Worship Center. Doors will open at 6 p.m. so you can be sure that you have a seat. It's time to take your next step. Join us for our next Connect to God in Concord group, which is an introduction to who we are and what we believe. This group meets on Sundays for four weeks beginning April 14th from 10 a.m. to 10.50 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Our next Deeply Rooted group begins Wednesday, April 17th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the worship classroom. Deeply Rooted is our study of scripture using the inductive method. We will be reading the book of Romans from April 17th to May 22nd. Thanks for joining us for worship. We hope you'll take advantage of these opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. Well, good morning. We're just so glad to have you with us, whether you're with us online or in person. It's such a beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we are just so gracious and thankful for that. When you came into the worship center this morning, you were provided with a connection card. We do ask that you complete both sides of the card on one side to register your attendance with us here this morning, and then on the other side to write down any prayer requests that you might have. During the week, our staff and our prayer team, we read through and discuss those requests and we lift them up. We want you to know that as part of being part of our community of faith, your journey is not alone. And if you're with us online, you also have the opportunity to go to concordunited.org forward slash pray and to leave your request there. If you are a first time guest with us this morning, we do ask that you text the word welcome to 865-302-3616. When you do that, you reach out to us and you provide us with an opportunity to reach out to you and to answer any questions that you might have regarding this church and our community of faith. And then also, if you are here and you are a first time guest, you are invited after the service to go to our connector. We have an information desk. We will provide you with a small gift in appreciation of the fact that you came out this morning to worship with us. Also, you may have already noticed if you came into church over by the connector area, we have a screen set up and we are asking for you to stop by so we can get your photo. We have a system that is called Realm and it's very, um, it's a directory for our church members and it is very helpful when you're trying to learn people's names to actually see a face there rather than a big old question mark. So if you will do that to, for, to, for us, especially for for me, because I'm very horrible with names, I really would appreciate that. As a reminder in our church, we do have four ways that you can give your tithes and offering this morning. We do have boxes on the walls, and as you leave the sanctuary, you may place your offering in there. You may also go online to concordunited.org forward slash give. You may text your offering to us or simply place it in an envelope and mail it to us. Let's um, stand up as you're able as we sing our doxology and praise to God for all of the many blessings that he provides to us. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, we want to remind you that you can share a prayer request by writing it on the back of the connection card you received as you came into worship. If you're worshiping online, you can share a request at concordunited.org slash pray. Please know uh, our staff, our prayer team, our pastors, we all pray over those each week. It's one of the most important things we do for each other. Uh, we give thanks because God has given us this great gift of prayer where we can encounter God directly. Let's now calm and quiet our hearts as we prepare to pray together.
Gracious God, we need your spirit to fall upon us freshly this morning. We woke up in desperate need of you, and we will go to bed in desperate need of you. Only you can show us the path that you have for us in this life. Only you can show us the way of goodness, mercy, and love, because you are the author of all love. You are the king of mercy, and you are the only one who is truly good, the giver of every good and perfect gift. We turn to you today. You have searched us and you have found us in the dark places to which we have run. On the paths that you never designed for us to go down, you have chased us until we turned around. We give you thanks. Oh Lord, we ask that you would allow us to turn back towards you, to set aside all the passions and the goals and the dreams that are out of line with your will and to find in you perfect love, to find in you perfect contentment, to find in you perfect holiness, the holiness we have seen in your son, uh, the holiness that we desire in some small way, uh, some way that simply reflects his light to have in our lives. Forgive us for the times we have turned away from you, for the times in which we have hurt one another by what we have done and by what we have left undone for the times in which we felt self-sufficient, for the times in which we ignored the needs of those around us. Oh God, we ask you, be at work in us. Be at work in this church, this church which you planted in this place over 150 years ago. Help us as a community of faith to continue to fulfill our purpose, to love this community to serve this community, to teach the ways of faith and of salvation, to invite each one who does not yet know you to discover the captain of their souls, to discover the Savior of their lives. We pray this in your name. We ask only that you would open our eyes that we might see all the truth that you would reveal all the love that you hold, all the grace that guides us each day, each moment. Amen.
It's wonderful to be with you today as we begin our April sermon series, Awakened, uh, looking at John Wesley and the Methodist movement and how John Wesley in his life was awakened to God's presence and started a movement that in an unprecedented manner started churches, schools, and hospitals throughout Europe, throughout the New World in America, and now uh, throughout all, all the continents of the world, how we are still part of that movement today. One of the things the first Methodists were known for was their singing. And the anthem you just heard is from an, an old Appalachian tune. And we know that God inspires music from all regions of the earth, and no region style is necessarily better or worse than others, uh, but uh, some are more equal than others. And <laughs> as an Appalachian, uh, I give thanks for our uh, uh, musical offering today. You know, when we look at what God is up to in our lives, what we find is that God often goes, in fact, God always goes first and God goes last. God is before us. God is behind us. God, God is all around us as we journey through our lives. And as you journey through your life in contemporary America, one of the things you'll discover is that one of the best things about America is the freedom to pursue happiness. And one of the worst things about America is you can't find happiness by pursuing it. If you just pursue happiness, you will not find it. It's a byproduct. You can't get there by going after it. It's like chasing the moon. When the astronauts go to the moon, they don't set their ship for the moon because the moon is moving. They have to go where it's going to be. We don't chase after happiness. But if you chase after holiness, what you'll find is it also leads to happiness. Now, we're going to talk throughout this series about John Wesley's life. And he could have told you that from his life. He spent quite a bit of time trying to find contentment on his own and eventually figured out that he couldn't. He was something of a perfectionist. I know that we don't have any people here. Uh, no people here that struggle with perfectionism. But he tried to do everything right, and he thought if he could just do things right enough, he could earn God's grace, and he would know God's love, and he would feel God's presence. And he tried and tried for the first two and a half decades of his life to do as many good things as he could do and to be perfect, and it made him miserable. Do you know people like that? Like, they have these perfect resumes. They're always volunteering. They're, they're helping the needy. They're, they're giving of their, their money. They're doing all these great things. And they are miserable people to be around. They're, they're just miserable because they're, they're just caught up in this insecurity. And thankfully, uh, they're living it out in maybe a more helpful way than some people. But they're caught up in this insecurity of trying to prove their worth through being perfect, and it never works. It, it, it just never works. A lot of us have lived our lives like that. We wear ourselves out trying to solve this puzzle of life, and I've been there. And I want to ask you today, as you look at your life, is your life a puzzle to be solved, or is it an adventure guided by the Holy Spirit? Which way are you living your life. I remember when I first graduated seminary and became a pastor, I went to my first church. I was so excited to, to be there. And uh, after a year, I, they did an evaluation of me. And coming out of seminary, I, I could preach a sermon. Uh, it was, uh, I guess you could say, uh, manageable. 
You could get through it uh, without falling asleep or without being too offended. Uh, I could teach a Bible study. I knew how to make a hospital visit, perform a funeral, perform a wedding. I, I could do all those things. And I came in for my first evaluation, and they said these glowing nice things about me. And then I looked at my church, and there were slightly less people involved in the ministries than there had been a year ago. And there was slightly, not much, but slightly less money in the offering plate. And we had slightly less mission ministries than we did a year ago. And they told me I was doing great. And I thought, I don't think we have the same definition of great. I think you're just nice. But I feel like we're failing. And I feel like I'm failing. And the problem is, I don't know how to not fail because I'm doing everything I can. So I realized there was so much I didn't know. So much I didn't know about what it means for a church to unite together in a vision of blessing our community, in a vision of making disciples and growing in our faith together, in a vision of surrendering our entire lives to Jesus Christ, in a vision of loving one another as he loved us. It doesn't just happen uh, because you go to worship or go to Sunday school. There's much more to it. And there was so much I needed to learn. And I knew I didn't know what I didn't know, but I knew there was a lot I didn't know. So I spent the next three years rapidly looking everywhere I could to learn what I didn't know. And after that three-year time, I I came in for my evaluation, and they said nice things about me because they were nice people. But by this point, I I knew that wasn't really... uh, a true picture of what was going on but I looked and there were slightly more people involved and uh, there were uh, slightly uh, more money in the offering plate and there were slightly more ministries to reach out to the community but then I looked inside and I saw that in all my striving uh, to help our church by providing more skilled leadership the passion in me for faith to know God, uh, the depth uh, and the fire of my prayer life had lessened. It had become more about me. It had become about skills and tools which are good and which God desires for us to acquire and pursue, to use all the gifts he gave us. Uh, but there was something that was, that was out of balance. Uh, I turned my life and my ministry into a puzzle to be solved uh, rather than an adventure guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, And I I called a a friend and we met at Wright's Cafeteria. Anybody ever go to Wright's Cafeteria? We met there at Wright's Cafeteria over chicken and mashed potatoes with gravy. And we talked about this. And we talked about the desperate need we had to pursue more skillful leadership, but the even more desperate need we had to keep our souls alive uh, and our eyes upon God in the process. And we created a small group for that purpose, uh, for Bible study, uh, for prayer, and to encourage one another in leadership. That group is almost 17 years old now and has has been going ever, ever since with some new people coming in, some new people going out but some consistent people there uh, for, for the whole time. Friends, have, have you been there? Have you made your life into a puzzle uh, rather than an, an adventure? Uh, do you find yourself living and just waiting, uh, waiting until you can have that season of life uh, where your spouse is happy and your kids are happy and your parents are happy? To have that season of life when you're happy with your boss and you're happy with all the people who report to you and they're all happy with you? Are you waiting for that season when you have perfect health, uh, when you don't have any little aches and pains or uh, large illnesses that you're dealing with, for that season of life when you have perfect wealth, when you're able uh, to have the type of home you want to have, the type of 
car you want to have. Take the type of trips you want to take and have enough left over that you have a rainy day fund, even if it gets very rainy, where you know you're going to be okay. If you are waiting uh, to be happy with your life until you have perfect health, perfect wealth, and the perfect family, you're just going to keep waiting. I'm sorry, that's the most truthful thing I have to share with you today. You're just going to keep waiting. You might get that for a day or two. But there's something more to life. There's something more, and it's actually better than all that, even if you could have it. And it's living a life that's an adventure guided by the Holy Spirit. This is why we encourage you to begin each day in uh, Bible study and prayer. You can find a Bible reading guide and a daily devotional at concordunited.org slash Bible. You can pick up the reading guide as a printout at our information center if you're here in person. So that each day you're starting your day. You're starting the day as an adventure guided by the Holy Spirit. Because even in the midst of all that imperfection, and perhaps because of all that imperfection, God may put something there in your life that you could never have otherwise. And uh, this was... Uh, certainly known uh, to John Wesley. I want to read to you about this grace of God that in- encounters us. Uh, this, this is from uh, Ephesians 2, uh, beginning uh, with 10, uh, or excuse me, begin- Ephesians 2, verse 8 uh, through verse 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, works which God has prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Did you hear that first bit in verse 8? For by grace you have been saved through faith. You were saved by grace. You are encountered by grace. Not because you were good enough, not because you earned it, not because you got perfect enough, but because God gave it and because you simply had the ability to say yes to it. Uh, John Wesley referred to the ability to say yes to God's grace, to experience God, even when we've turned and run away from God, as uh, provenient grace. This is the grace of God that goes before us, the grace of God that surrounds us before we even know God. In his sermon called On Working Out Salvation, John Wesley describes it as the first wish to please God before you even believe in God. Uh, the, The first dawn of light concerning God's will and the first conviction of our sin and need for forgiveness. Now, John Wesley called it provenient grace. Uh, That's an old-timey word. Uh, Sometimes in those days, it was also called preventing grace because it prevented us from going too far away from God to turn back to God. Sometimes it was called enabling grace because it enabled us to turn back towards God. I like to call it, as a Star Wars fan, Darth Vader grace. And I have shared this uh, with many of you in Bible studies, and I will share it again because I have a microphone. Uh, in the first, uh, the original three movies of Star Wars, it's the story of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. We all know who the father is. And there's this big debate between Luke Skywalker and his mentor, Obi Wan Kenobi on whether there is any good left in Darth Vader, whether God's grace is still at work on Darth Vader. And Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you know your church history and theology, he was a Calvinist, probably would be a Presbyterian. Uh, He, uh, God bless him, uh, he felt that Darth Vader had moved beyond God's grace. Now, Luke Skywalker was a Wesleyan Methodist. And... Luke Skywalker believed in provenient grace, and he believed there was still good in Darth Vader. And I think we all know how the movie turns out. That's the kind of grace we're talking about. The grace of God that is offensive in its breadth and its depth, that encounters us not just at our best, but at our worst, that gives us the opportunity to turn our lives into an adventure guided by the Holy Spirit. Author Anne Lamont in a TED Talk several years ago, described grace like this. She said, grace is spiritual WD-40 or water wings. The mystery of grace is that God loves 
Henry Kissinger, Vladimir Putin, and me exactly as much as God loves your new grandchild. There's a lot in there. For some of you under the age of 30, Google Henry Kissinger. Fascinating political figure. I had to as well. But that God could love the villains and the heroes as much as the grandbabies. That God could give us this grace, which is spiritual WD-40, uh, which enables us to get out of situations we could never get out of otherwise, or spiritual water wings, which keeps our head above water, when otherwise we are like a child that would drown in, in the choppy seas. This grace of God that pursues us. And what we find in this provenient grace is that you can run from God, but you can't hide. You can't hide. Wherever you run to, God will pursue you. And in fact, God will already be there waiting on you. If there was ever a time when God would have had good reason to give up on the church, that in Wesley's day in the Church of England uh, in the 1700s, that would have been a good time. Uh, if you know the story of the church, you know for the first 300 years of church history, the church was one of the most phenomenal, miraculous, sociological events the world had ever seen, such that modern-day historians still cannot explain it in purely secular terms. How the church grew throughout the Mediterranean world as a persecuted minority, caring for the sick and the dying, the widows and the orphans, uh, and talking about this man who came back from the dead, who nobody, which nobody thought possible, except that these people said they'd seen him, and they suddenly had this courage and this power, which changed everything about that area of the world. And then uh, it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And suddenly the church was able to collect taxes and the church was able to build armies. And people started going into church leadership, uh, not so much to share the gospel, uh, but to gain political power. And the church became uh, what you would believe to be hopelessly corrupt uh, over the centuries, even while there were many sincere Christians in the church continuing to spread the gospel and share it th throughout the world. And God didn't give up on the church. He gave the church something called the Protestant Reformation. Uh, which reformed the church of much of its political corruption and caused within the Catholic Church what's known as the Counter-Reformation, which helped uh, with the corruption uh, in the Catholic Church of those who did not follow the Protestant Reformation and become Protestants. But within that, there was this thing called the Church of England. The Church of England was a hybrid church. In 1534, Henry VIII, you remember him from that song, he's crazy. Well, uh, he wanted to get a divorce from his wife, and he needed the Pope to grant him an annulment. Problem was, he married the Pope's cousin. Pope wasn't going to grant an annulment when you're trying to divorce his cousin. He might be the Pope. He's a human. That's how humans work. Well, Henry VIII was a human. Henry VIII was a king. Henry VIII got upset about that. Henry VIII said, we don't need you, Pope, and your Catholic church. We'll start a church right here in England. We'll call it the Church of England. I'll be the head of the church. I'll be Pope and king of the church in England. I'll grant myself a divorce whenever I want a divorce. And that's, he was king. That's, that's what he did. And because they split with the Catholicism based on a political difference, not theology. They kept a lot of the Catholic ways. And uh, there was beauty within this Church of England. They produced the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, many of our prayers that we find in our hymnal and our prayer books are based on this book. Some of the most beautiful, faithful prayers ever written are contained in, in that Book of Common Prayer. And over, over the years, they also engaged in political corruption because of their connection to the government in, of England. And there was massive bloodshed in England uh, between this new Church of England uh, and Catholics. You might remember uh, that there's a reason why there's a drink called Bloody Mary. Uh, and the reason there's that drink, which isn't particularly good for you, was because there was this queen, which wasn't particularly good uh, for England, uh, who was a Catholic, who brought about massive bloodshed between Protestants and Catholics uh, with, within England. In the late 1500s, along comes something in England called the Elizabethan Settlement. And I know those of you right now who wa watch the History Channel, you're like, this is the greatest sermon ever. And, <laughs> and I know those of you who don't are like, please God, make it stop. <laughs> well, he's not going to for a couple minutes. 
as long as the power stays on. Uh, in the late 1500s, Queen Elizabeth came, and she worked out some compromises uh, that allowed for a more peaceful future. The Church of England went back to being Protestant, but there was more freedom for Catholics, and there was more uh, acceptance of some Catholic traditions. But this church was still terribly corrupt. It, though they got rid of some of the political corruption, uh, they still had the heresy of the prosperity gospel. They didn't call it the prosperity gospel back then, but what happened was they, they thought the people who were wealthy, uh, that those were the people who were close to God, and they thought the people who were poor, those were pe people who were far from God, because if you're poor, it, it can't be because you grew up in generational poverty and society had been structured so that you couldn't move between classes. It had to be because you were a worse sinner than those folks who just happened to be, be born in mansions and palaces on grand estates and that they taught this and they created church such that only the high class could afford the clothes you needed and appreciate the kind of music that was was played in church at that day and uh, the people who went to church they didn't usually go to bible study they didn't have something called sunday school they they went to church they sat there in their nice clothes they did business deals on the the way out the door they knew enough about christianity to be dangerous uh, john wesley would later call people like this double children of the devil because you know just enough about Christianity to believe uh, that uh, Jesus uh, is your Lord and Savior uh, but you don't know enough to know who he actually is so you make him in your image and suddenly he has all your prejudices and biases he hates the people you hate and loves the people you love and that's not Jesus and this was the church and God didn't give up on it and God could have easily given up on John Wesley, this perfectionism, uh, this perfectionist young person who grew up should have known more about grace than anybody. He was born in 1703. He was the 15th of 19 children, only nine of whom uh, survived childbirth. He was born to Samuel uh, Wesley and Susanna Wesley. Samuel uh, was a local uh, priest in the Church of England at Epworth. Uh, Susanna was an educated and independent-minded woman who educated all her children in, in her home. In 1709, the roof of their parsonage caught fire, they, and there are some who believe it was set fire by people who didn't like the preaching of Samuel Wesley wanted him to leave town, and thought everybody could get out. We don't know that for sure, uh, but uh, let me tell you, um, churches have always had issues. Uh, well, uh, the neighbors come, and they realize there's this five-year-old boy named John, and he's stuck on the top floor, and the roof's on fire, and he can't get out. And they make a human ladder, and they, they take him down. And he decides he wants to be like his dad. He wants to be a pastor. He studies at Oxford. Uh, he organizes Bible studies. And, and he starts ministries to go into the debtor's prisons and to, to bring food to, to the widows. But he's a miserable person. Because as much as he wants to serve God, he hasn't encountered God for himself. He's still trying to earn it. And as long as you're trying to earn it, it's hard to receive it. But something happened. And next week, we're going to talk about the very lowest moment in his life and how, how God met him there. But as we talk about this and what it means for us, I want you to know one thing perfectly clear. We do not worship John Wesley. But we point to Wesley because Wesley's life points us to Christ and gives us a way of being church that our world desperately needs. That is why we do what we do. And I want you to know one more thing. Next week, we'll talk about Wesley's darkest moment. But in your darkest moment, in the pit of hell, Jesus is still Lord. Jesus is still Lord in the pit of hell. What I, one of the things I love about the Easter season is we talk about this Christian belief that after Jesus was crucified, before he appeared, after, and after he was resurrected, but before he appeared to the disciples, he actually descended to hell. And he broke the gates of hell. He went into the prison and he busted the gates to set souls free. And then you may remember uh, Matthew 16 verse 18 where he looks at Peter. After Peter has recognized him uh, as the son of the living God. 
And he says, I tell you this, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. And what that means is that the mission of the church, you'll notice the gates won't stand against it. Well, gates are a defensive military installment. They are not an offensive. For the gates to not be able to stand against the church means the goal of the church is to invade hell. The go- and to knock down the gates. In fact, simply to trample over the gates that Jesus has already knocked down. Jesus has already invaded hell. If, if you encounter the devil, I want you to know that the scriptures describe the devil as a roaring lion. But what we know of Easter tells us that the devil is also a toothless lion. And you need to know there's a power so much greater than that devil. There's a power so much greater in the pit of your hell right there with you, right there waiting. And I imagine after Jesus knocked down the gates of hell, if there were souls still in there, it's because they refused to lift up their eyes. It's because they refused to look around and see what had happened Uh, They had learned to love the darkness more than the light. Christ is right there, knocking down the gates, knocking on the door of your heart, waiting for you to quit being so busy trying to make all the puzzle pieces fit, to look up and to see that he's right there and he's not going anywhere. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you encounter us in the pit of our hell. And we thank you that you encounter us with a power great enough to break the gates of hell. We thank you that you were with us and we, that we were a dream in your heart from before the foundation of the world. That you were with us when we took our first breath and that you will be with us when we breathe our final one. We give you thanks that you pursue us on our best days and on our worst. We give you thanks that you wait for us. Teach us, Lord, to lift up our eyes and having seen you, to never be the same. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate communion, I would just give you a couple of words of instruction. We will have two stations, one in front of me and one in front of the pulpit. We also have a gluten-free station to your uh, right if you require that. We ask that you exit by the side aisles and return to your seats by the center aisle. And just to remind you that this is not the table of Concord United Methodist Church. This is not a United Methodist table. This is God's table and he invites all. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. 
By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he gave thanks to you. He took the cup, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'd like to invite those who will assist in serving communion to come forward. Will you come and receive?
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your love to give ourselves for one another. Amen. As you go from this place, if you're planning to go to brunch, get your picture made first in the connector. If you're planning to go to Sunday school, go quickly and tell your preacher, your, your teacher, that your preacher is sorry you are late. He got excited. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about Methodism today uh, and John Wesley, if you want more of a history lesson, we have a new Sunday school class starting for six to eight weeks to talk about that in the chapel Uh, beginning right now. And after Sunday school, go get your picture made. Now, go from this place with the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, this and each day. And may those in this world to whom love is a stranger find in you most generous friends. Amen.